everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's really great to be here in this virtual workspace um, with you all, as I'm also in my physical workspace. So my name is Caitlin Goodman. I am the curator here at the Rare Book Department of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, I want to start off just with a few program notes about uh, this talk and about the platform that you're, you're watching it on. Um, for those of you who are new to Crowdcast, um, you can see me and hear me, hopefully, um, but I can't see or hear any of you. Um, I would love to answer questions, um, so please feel free to put them right in the chat box, or you can hit the ask a question button. It's basically the same thing. Either way, I will see them and then be able to answer them. Um, the other funny thing about this streaming system is I am actually talking to you from about 15 seconds in the future. Um, that means it's not going to be easy for me to take questions during the presentation because I'm going to be, a, you know, a little bit ahead of where you are back in the past, I back there. Um, but at the very end, I will go back and I can go back into the presentation or I can bring back up the document camera that I have set up. And uh, so just make a note of whatever it is that you're curious about or want to hear more about. And at the end, we can always sort of track back. Um, the recording will end up on this website. If you love it so much, you need to see it again. Uh, we're also going to post it to our YouTube page later this week. Um, so with that, please give a warm welcome to Medieval Life, European Manuscripts in Philadelphia Collections. Uh, my talk today will hopefully whet your appetite, not just for the exhibition, but also for the variety of artifacts we have here at the Free Library and the enduring stories that they tell about their lives and ours. So Medieval Life, um, which is the main exhibition we have, it celebrates the end of a three-year project, which was funded by CLEAR. Uh, that stands for the Council on Library and Information Resources. Um, the project was called Bibliotheca Philadelphiensis. Not the catchiest title. Um, we nicknamed it Bibliophily. Bibliophily brought together nearly all of Philadelphia's medieval and Renaissance Western European manuscripts to be fully digitized uh, and fully cataloged. And they're now all fully online in the public domain. So you can go and see and sort of page through any of them from your own home, download any images you might want, et cetera. Um, so for the sake of brevity, this exhibition is called Medieval Life, uh, but more accurately, it is books written by hand in Western Europe between 800 and 1600. Um, the through line is that while these manuscripts and related objects may be old or hard to read, um, if they're in difficult scripts or different languages, uh, the things medieval Europeans were thinking about aren't so different from what we may be thinking about. Is it going to rain tomorrow? Can I afford that? Uh, what happens when I die? And since that premise is that these universal themes are universal, we took the sections that divide medieval life and put together a hallway gallery to accompany it that highlights the breadth of our special collections here at the Free Library. Because the Free Library has a bunch of special collections and we each specialize in different kinds of objects from different time, kinds of topics, um, the Rare Book Department has a fancy exhibition gallery, but we're all working together to make accessible historic materials that can help promote understanding of our shared cultural heritage. I am happy to take questions about any of the special collections um, or any of the objects that I'm talking about. Uh, my answer might just be, I'll get back to you and I'll check with one of my colleagues, um, but I will get back to you. So let's look at some stuff. Our camera setup um, is a little ad hoc. Uh, so I can't bring everything on camera, and as you'll sort of see when we get to the camera part, some things are a little blurry, um, and hopefully I don't make anyone seasick with our uh, DIY document camera. But I've pulled a handful of objects from the hallway gallery and have plenty of photos for everything else. So we're starting off with the section about family. Um, this photograph album is from the theater collection. Uh, Dorothy Van Engel was an American actress in the 1930s. 
She starred in what is called race films, which is the term for movies made outside of the Hollywood studio system uh, for black audiences by black creators. The theater collection may seem like an odd fit for a movie actress's family photo album, but actually the collection covers all kinds of popular entertainment, um, including film, um, circus, radio, uh, and it also includes both personal and professional records. Uh, this album is what we would call a personal record. Uh, it includes photos of Van Engel alongside friends and family. It includes her future husband. It's a really nice artifact from her life that also sheds light a little bit on her work. Uh, showing how confusing some of the library terminology can be, this is actually also what would count as a personal record. Um, even though it was made by Isabel Rojas as part of her profession, that of children's book illustrator. Rojas designed the cover for the YA novel, The Land of Forgotten Girls, which is a book centered on sisterhood. That's why it's incorporated into the family theme. Um, Rojas gave this sketch, along with a bunch of her illustrations and marketing materials and some zines she made, to the Children's Literature Research Collection. Um, this particular sketch was actually made a couple years ago in 2015. I know that often many library users who encounter special collections automatically think old, you know, you hear rare book department, you hear special collections, and you think, you know, very old. Uh, the scope of special collections is actually very broad. And so we have materials from, you know, we do have some very old things, I'll show some. Uh, but we also have things that were made just this year. Um, so it's all kinds of distinct materials, both old and modern. Um, this book is indeed a little older, uh, much like some of the family objects on view in the Medieval Life exhibition, like the family trees or the coats of arms. This is a manuscript of genealogical tables, and it sort of functions to claim privilege based on ancestry. Uh, the earlier part of the manuscript is the genealogical tables of the prophets of Islam, um, and then there are tables for the earlier Persian dynasties. This opening uh, specifically traces the family of Fat Ali Shah, who was the second ruler of Qajar, Iran. Um, you can see here the circa dates, or that's actually his reigning dates in Qajar, Iran. Um, this is a showstopper in the manuscript. Fat Ali Shah's name is written in uh, gold, uh, in that central medallion. It's topped with a crown. Um, and then it's surrounded by circles of his famously prolific offspring. Uh, I think it is still a matter of debate how many children he fathered. Uh, this opening only marks the sons, at least 50 of whom were still alive when he died in 1834. This manuscript doesn't have a date, but since it ends so showily with Fatali Shah, um, it's fairly easy to assume that it was probably made during his reign. Uh, moving into a different section, one on religion, one of the things that's important to make clear about medieval life is that it not only focuses on Western Europe between you know, 800 and 1600 due to its connection with that big digitization and cataloging project I spoke about, Bibliophily, um, but also it focuses, you know, it's a physical exhibition. We hope to have you see it soon. It focuses on objects that we own here at the Free Library or were able to borrow from Philadelphia area uh, institutions and collections that participated in Bibliophilia. So, for example, while medieval Europe was not mostly Christian or mostly wealthy, most of the stuff on view is mostly Christian and mostly made for upper class owners. Uh, Europe had major centers of Islam and Judaism as well. Um, this book is not from Europe, um, but this particular manuscript, which is a handwritten scroll uh, of the Book of Esther, was probably made in Palestine before 1600. So it's, you know, if you are generous about what the medieval period is, it's a medieval manuscript um, of some of our Judaica. Uh, unlike many of the luxurious objects that have achieved second lives, thanks in part to a book trade, that tends to, or tended, really, it's not like that anymore, but tended to a focus more on the fancy or the famous. Um, this scroll was actually not made by a professional scribe, um, and it was probably used for the home. The detail shot I have up there, uh, this is a little fragile to bring out, so I wasn't able to show.
of it. But the detail shot shows that the parchment it's on is not particularly well uh, treated. Um, it's a little rough. There are some thinnesses and weaknesses in it. And then the scribe itself, the handwriting, is not very regular or even. Um, this was not someone whose profession probably had been to be a professional scribe. Of course, a lot of religious practice is indeed private or personal. Um, this book is entirely pictorial. Uh, it does have a few captions written in it, but it's, it's you know 95% images. Um, it's a personal selection of devotional items from the Christian uh, tradition, uh, from the Christian Bible, folded and sewn together to make an accordion-style book um, so that you could theoretically stretch it out and it would be quite long indeed. Uh, St. George, who's the one pictured in the larger image here, is the patron saint of Ethiopia. He's an important saint in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, uh, which has been the predominant uh, church and religion in Ethiopia for about 1700 years. Um, the illustrations in this manuscript aren't chronologically linked. It's not like you're reading through the Bible. Instead, you can sort of find the one that is the appropriate space for your own personal devotion and choose your own based on that. Um, this genre of artifact, um, sometimes called a sensel, uh, became popular around the 1500s, although this one is later, um, and it is sort of an object of personal devotion that would be used in the home for an individual or for a family. So this painting is a different kind of devotional narrative. Um, it tells the story of the birth of Krishna, one of the most revered gods in the Hindu pantheon. Um, you can see it in decent focus here, and I'm about to switch to less great focus. So, sorry about that. So the story it tells begins in the upper right. Uh, this is where Krishna has been replaced by a new infant. And here is Krishna's father spiriting him away from uh, his murderous brother-in-law and crossing the spiritually significant Yamuna River. Um, there are some of the other major gods in Hinduism. This is Brahma and Shiva. Uh, and then Krishna's father uh, being presented. Some gods uh, have put the guards to sleep to help allow Krishna to safely escape. Um, and then he went on to be raised by cow herds um, before taking his place in the Godhead. Um, one of the interesting things that you can see, even within this like really blurry, it just, I can't figure out the focus part, but one of the interesting things is uh, all of the liberal application of gold. And so as I shift it in the light, you can see the dimensionality of the painting. Um, this is a fairly typical topic for a Rajasthani painting in the 18th century. Um, it's painted in really vibrant colors. It has liberal application of gold and silver. Um, often they would do a lot of court portraits and then also scenes from the Hindu scriptures. One of the funny things about imaging two-dimensional objects uh, with gold is like sometimes when you're doing uh, archival imaging, which means you want it to be sort of as flat and neutral as possible, you lose a lot of the richness of the gold, which of course is you know, one of the signifiers for why this object was important. And so it's always really nice to be able to see something in person with theatrical lighting or dramatic lighting that really emphasizes the special nature of the object. And then we can move on to the natural world. Uh, one of the features throughout the main exhibition, Medieval Life, is the thoughtful pairing of historical artifacts, that is, you know, medieval European manuscripts, with contemporary objects. So looking at the natural world, visitors will be looking at a medieval English physician's reference text. Um, it's, a, it's a belt book, which is a genre of manuscript that would be able to be worn on the physician's belt and then unfolded from there. Here is a section that has been unfolded for the sake of imaging. Uh, this is a urine wheel. Uh, those pictures running around the perimeter are the urine samples, all a variety of intriguing colors. And then it would be paired with the diagnostic criteria of, you know, what, what does it mean if your urine is dark red? Uh, 
It's paired with, in the exhibition gallery, and now in this slide, with the much more familiar specimen cup, um, which is how we today, you know, still collect urine because it is diagnostic for a great variety of health problems. Uh, I am disappointed to admit I do not have more urine-themed objects. Uh, I do really like this score diagram. This is one of the, from one of the newer maps that was added to the map collection. Um, one of the volunteers who works in the map collection had this map for her own travels to South Africa and then donated it to the collection. Um, and now we're able to put it out on view. Uh, one of the things that's neat about this, and I think is something that you see in maps throughout their you know, extremely long history, is that it's not always easy to incorporate the physical scale of the natural world in a printed object. So here's the spore diagram, which is all of the animal tracks. And of course, hippopotamus is on there right next to mongoose, and they are animals with vastly different footprints. But in the, for the sake of it being a physical object, that, that scale is sort of lost. Uh, and that translates really nicely to another map, which is this comparative sizes of lakes and islands. Um, another interesting thing about doing this talk in the virtual space with our, you know, kind of wonky document camera is we're talking about translating the natural world into a physical form, like a map, and then here I am translating it into a virtual form like this presentation. Um, so the reality is this map is, is quite large. It's larger than the space I have available to show it. Um, it then also reinterprets how we think of the world by placing all of these, for example, islands of the Western hemisphere together, irrespective of where they are geographically, and you can get a much better sense of their actual size. Um, Cuba here is by far the largest. Um, Vancouver, you know, is right in the center, but it's much smaller. Um, and then for you watching this, it depends on how small or large they look based on basically your, your device screen. If you're watching it on a nice large desktop computer, you'll have a much better time reading the detail of this map than if you're watching it on your smartphone. So it's sort of an idea of talking about mediation um, and how we can organize information for ourselves and how we can use it to tell stories. Um, that tends to be the kind of thing that's interesting to a librarian. It is interesting to me. Um, and uh, this is an almanac. Uh, almanacs, for example, have been around for thousands of years. Um, a huge variety of cultures have made and used almanacs. They're predictive in that they tell you what to expect from the natural world in that coming year. Uh, but they also serve a variety of cultural aims, particularly when you look at American almanacs. Uh, so this one I am able to do uh, some job of showing. So switching to this, this is Benjamin Banneker's Almanac for 1795. It was published in Philadelphia. Benjamin Banneker was a black writer and naturalist and inventor. He helped to survey Washington, D.C. when they were making it the nation's capital. Um, he published six almanacs, so this is, this is one of them. They include weather forecasts and lunar charts. So you can see throughout it has, here, let's see if I can bring it a little closer to our camera. It has a calendar in it, um, not dissimilar to the medieval Christian calendars in the books of hours that we'll see in medieval life. And it has the eclipses and other important information for helping people to understand the shape of their year to come. Um, the other thing that Benjamin Banneker would do in his almanacs is he would write commentaries or abolitionist essays. So there was an additional uh, narrative portion that was outside of the sphere of predictive forecasts. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this copy is the signs of it as a specific copy. So for example, you have the name of a former owner, Theophilus Harris, which he inscribed in the top of his book. And then throughout the book you have, whether by him or someone else, someone who made some notations, uh, perhaps correcting the predictions against what actually happened um, and noting special passages that he really appreciated. Uh, in addition to these historical marks of the sort of material history of the object, there is uh, our own library marks to it. 
Um, and so if you look more closely at the title page, you can see that those perforated holes, the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, like many institutions, uh, we used to mark our books and objects and prints that seemed susceptible basically to theft. Um, so if you have a nice book and it has a lot of beautiful maps or beautiful prints in it, the Free Library of Philadelphia would have, with a very large perforated stamp, stamped its name right through the center of all of those prints. And the idea is then that disincentivizes someone from coming with a knife, cutting out the print, selling them, etc. Um, of course, it also permanently defaces this great portrait of Benjamin Banneker. Uh, and it's not really reversible. The other wonderful thing the Free Library did but doesn't do anymore is this great binding. It is extremely sturdy. Uh, unfortunately, it's completely ahistorical. It actually damages the integrity of the object inside because of the, the kind of binding job. It's not great to just glue it right in here. Um, this was a pamphlet that then was bound in. And so it's damaging the original pages because it's stitched right through that. Um, anyway, this is what we call a library binding. It is not unusual for some of the objects with longer histories within the free library to have been rebound in this way because it would make them sturdier for use. Um, this is not something that we do anymore because now when we look at our collection care priorities and the technicians who do a lot of the really wonderful treatment and preservation work on the objects that we take care of, the idea is for it to be historically appropriate, uh, material safe, and then also reversible. Uh, we can't unperforate Benjamin Banneker's face, and so that kind of thing has fallen out of fashion, basically universally. Um, we can use that binding crime to translate to the next section, law and justice. Um, this particular image is from the Medieval Life Exhibition. Uh, it is uh, lent to us from Penn. It's a page that survives from a 13th century text of laws written for and about the functioning of the Catholic Church. Um, it's called Canon Law. Uh, the main text is the two columns, uh, which are written much larger, and then all along the borders is the commentary or the gloss in a much smaller script. So it's neat, at least to me, to compare it to this law text that I am able to, to pull out. So this law text was written in Turkey. It's uh, written in Persian, um, and it has a similar design in terms of the space of the page to the medieval example of canon, canon law. And so looking at it in person, uh, you can see throughout the manuscript the text has actually been glossed by different readers. So it's a little different because this one shows the signs of it having been read uh, by different figures through history. And I'm sorry that like, I'm just awkwardly holding this up to the camera. It's the best solution I've found. Um, that then engage with the main text. Um, and it is not accidental, of course, that the book has the main text confined to such a small proportion of the page. This was by design. It was by design to allow for people to engage with the text. Um, it's a Hanafi text uh, based on, it's a, a school of Islamic law um, that about a third of Muslims globally uh, follow. And as a text, a lot of Islamic scholars would be responding to it, responding to other people who respond to it, bringing it in, having arguments with it, uh, etc. Uh, during its primary life. Uh, now that you know it's here in the rare book department, we do not have anyone commenting in it, but we have had Hanafi scholars come in to look at it. Uh, so it's having sort of a different sort of second life. Uh, the other thing that we can see when we look at it in person is you can see the Islamic book structure, which is a little different. Uh, the books are read from left to right, or so from right to left, as opposed to an English language book that's left to right. And so this is the upper cover. Um, with the upper cover and a flat binding, which is a pretty traditional structure, you would enclose the flap, close the upper cover on it, and you'd have something of a little bit of a secure package where the fore edge is safely enclosed. And then because the books were so frequently um, shelved flat with their bottom edge out, the title of the book could be written on the bottom edge. Uh, 
this book also has, in addition to a bunch of, so these are some defaced earlier owner marks that have been erased, um, and earlier owners have marked it up. But it also has a table of contents. And so you can see how that was structured with the section headings followed by the numbers. Um, and so if you don't read Persian, for example, you will still recognize some of these numbers, which are Arabic numerals, and we used an adapted version of that today. Um, oh, one more thing I want to show before I move away from the law text is this one, after the table of contents, you have the beginning of the manuscript. Uh, the ruling would have been done before it was written, and so this ruling, which is like a huge blank space at the top, is the space where the artist would have put in a headpiece decoration, which is a common thing that you see even in mostly unillustrated Islamic manuscripts. Uh, this one, the artist never showed up. And so instead, we just have the empty ruling where the heading would be and then the geometric de decoration that isn't. Uh, so law. Uh, it is popularly understood to be sort of complicated and overlapping. We just saw a canon law piece that was filled with its own gloss this Islamic legal text that had commentary by a number of later readers. Um, it's sort of interesting when you're looking at the long history of the law, how old this complex uh, nature of the subject is. And so we can look at you know, cuneiform. This is the oldest thing that I'm going to be showing. It's from the collection that has the oldest stuff that we have. We've got about 3,000 of these cuneiform tablets in our collection. Um, some of them are quite ancient, some of them are slightly less ancient, but they're all, you know, over 2,000 years old. This one is from about 600 BC. Um, it was, here, let me pull it up on view. So cuneiform, as you can see, it's actually not very big. Um, cuneiform is the earliest form of human writing. Uh, it was developed more than 5,000 years ago. Uh, this particular tablet uh, was part of the was part of the Neo Babylonian Empire. It's written in Akkadian. Um, cuneiform thrived for thousands of years, and so it would be written in a variety of languages. Um, tablets are not oft, not always this densely written. This is this is so dense and so complexly and minutely scribed a tablet because it's legal testimony. Um, it is a testimony against a shepherd who stole 10 sheep dedicated to the goddess of Uruk. Uh, he was sentenced to pay back his debt 30 fold, and then this tablet was endorsed by seven listed witnesses. And this is one of my favorite objects. Uh, I am, as a librarian, a generalist, uh, which is really great for me because I really love the opportunity to learn about so many different subjects from so many different scholars and experts, and then visitors who come through that have new stories to tell about all of these objects. Um, so it works for me that I know a little bit about a lot of things, and then I can rely on people who more deeply engage with the subject matter to help enlighten uh, different aspects of our collections. Uh, that said, of all of my favorite things, I'm especially fascinated by children's books and how they function as educational tools to build uh, moral and cultural competency um, very early in your cultural experience. Um, so in this example, this is an English language picture book that was written in China in the 1970s. It's called Capture the Old Bald Eagle. Um, here is Siu Chan who tosses and turns and cannot sleep. In order to protect collective property, he must wipe out that hateful eagle. Uh, this was written for Chinese English language learners rather than native English speakers who happened to be in China. Um, it was a book intended to sort of tell a political story. It's, it's not a particularly uh, subtle satire as far as these things go. The two good children are able to work together and cooperate to capture the old bald eagle who very selfishly is preying on um, and consuming more than his fair share of the agricultural product of the collective. 
Uh, so for people raised on American children's books, this feels very, you know, feels very strident. It feels very obvious. Capture the old bald eagle. Um, they're, they're there on the cover, you know, beating the, the bald eagle. Um, but of course, we, we raise our own children on American children's books that tell their own stories. Um, so, you know, to use a contemporary example, if anyone has read the Elephant and Piggy series of picture books, that's really about like building concepts of friendship that are central to our sense of cultural norms. Or um, a slightly older example is Dr. Seuss, The Lorax, um, which is still, you know, a very popular book today, but is itself a pretty strident text that is clearly making a uh, political and moral claim about what uh, good human behavior is. And uh, that's one of the things that's really fascinating about children's books, because they're written generally by adults and they're bought generally by adults. And so they share really an adult sense of what children should learn and can learn and should be and will be. Uh, and discussions of justice really are discussions of, you know, sort of what is acceptable to the community. Uh, this slide does the piece a bit of a disservice, but it's too large to show with my weird camera setup, so um, forgive the, the attempt to get a detailed shot. Uh, the Reentry Think Tank um, is a program that centers the Philadelphians who have been directly impacted by the criminal justice system. This is their Reentry Bill of Rights, which is a collective declaration, uh, I'm sorry, a collective declaration that was co-authored by 1,200 Philadelphians with criminal records. Um, and a group of reentry think tank fellows produced 20 copies of this fine press edition, which was printed on handmade paper made from shredded and pulped criminal records. Uh, the plan for this particular object, and that's why the detail shot is so sort of tightly focused in, um, zooming in so you can see the detail of the handmade paper. Uh, the plan for this particular object was to travel it around the free library locations. Uh, the pandemic has stamped out a lot of our physical programming. So we're working with the fellows to hopefully plan a live virtual event later this fall. Um, and if any of the fellows or anyone from the People's Paper Co-op are here in this talk, hi, thank you again for donating. Um, we are really thrilled to be collaborating with you on programming um, this coming fall and into the winter. Moving on to the final section, which is labor, or basically work. We have this great chart. Uh, this was designed by our graphics team. Uh, it breaks down Philadelphia's job sectors today. Um, so depending on the size of the screen you're looking at, it might be a little tough to read. Uh, what it's really showing is that Philadelphia is a center for jobs in healthcare, and then we're also a center for jobs in education. Um, you might have heard Philly called Eds and Meds. Um, we're unusually reliant on those two sectors. Uh, one of the big takeaways for this section on labor um, in the main medieval exhibition is that while work isn't always glamorous, sometimes the depictions of it are, um, especially when they were made for owners who valued the ethic of physical hard work, but weren't actually laboring themselves. Um, a great example of that is the many books of hours we have on view in medieval life. Uh, books of hours are a Christian devotional book. Uh, they survive in large numbers. Uh, they often start, or usually start, with a calendar. Um, so it'll list feast days, uh, it'll list, maybe it'll have a decoration for the zodiac. And then this one is a great example because it has really beautiful miniatures for the labors of the month, which is this iconographic series where every month there is a typical labor that would be performed. Uh, here you can see a peasant preparing wheat after harvest. Uh, the original owner of this manuscript, it's, it's since been cut up. We have, we have four pages there on view in medieval life. But the original owner of this manuscript was King Louis XII. Um, he would not have spent too much time preparing wheat. He would not be with that peasant. Um, idealizing a certain type of work without doing the work is, of course, not unique to the kings of Europe. Um, and so I'm pairing it with this map. Um, this is a later reprint, but it's an 1870s map of the boundaries of Philadelphia's soup societies, which is an earlier term for soup kitchen. Um, Philadelphia has a long history of soup kitchens. Uh, the 
oldest one is the Southwark Soup Society, which was founded in 1805. Uh, you can see it is down here in this region of the map. It's in the pink. Uh, the boards of the different areas are the soup societies. They're all listed in the key. I'll try to see if I can get this in focus. Probably not. Yeah, it's not helping me. Well, you can see here, or probably you can't, but just trust me that you can see here the names of all of the members of the boards. And for any of you who are from Philadelphia, some of those names would ring a bell. Um, Biddle, Childs, Lukens, Vo, etc. They're all names that you might know from, you know, maybe your neighborhood school is named after them, or you know, your library, or just a building that you pass. Uh, they aren't all sons of wealthy Quaker families with prestigious and lengthy histories in Philadelphia, but many of them are. It is very easy for someone who's interested in doing research on any of these people who are named on the board of the soup houses to find them. Um, they published their work, they saved their work, they donated their work to fancy institutions or prestigious collections um, where it was preserved and made accessible. Uh, it would not be easy or nearly as easy to find information about the men who went to the soup kitchens to eat the soup that supported them and their families. Um, it's, it's kind of a duh reveal, but uh, not all work is valued the same. And so there's really a big difference between whether you are able to be celebrated with enough leisure time that you can do these kinds of intensive charity works to make your name and build your moral profile or not. Um, so you can think about something like homemaking um, or cooking. And homemaking and cooking in America both have sort of a long literature, uh, scholarly literature behind it as being work that's traditionally performed by women um, and traditionally not valued in the same way as other kinds of work. So historically to talk about, say, the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, I've been working a lot on some New Deal stuff and so sort of front in my mind. It's a piece of New Deal legislation that's you know, still in effect today to varying degrees. It's what certified a minimum wage, um, overtime laws, things like that, and it's passed during the New Deal. And it actually explicitly excluded both agricultural workers and domestic workers. Uh, and it did that because it was a political compromise. Um, it was a political compromise with Southern Democrats who wanted to preserve the way of life that they had in the South uh, which was really predicated on exploiting black labor. Um, traditionally, that was working in the fields and in the home. Uh, and so it's sort of interesting to think about a cookbook, you know, this, this work document from an undervalued uh, sector of the economy that really keeps things running, and think about it ending up in a rare book department collection. But of course, this isn't just a cookbook. Uh, it's only about half recipes. It's a cookbook that was produced during World War I. And so that's, you know, before all that Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, but it's produced during World War I when a lot of staple foods were hard to source, particularly wheat and uh, meat. Um, and so since they were being diverted to the war effort, there was a little bit more of a patriotic boost to focusing on keeping your home. So we'll take a look at the cookbook for a minute. So something like a cookbook works, of course, on a few levels. Um, here you can see wheatless cake number two. Uh, it doesn't sound very good. It's made with all kinds of substitutes, including mashed potatoes, although I have heard of mashed potato cookies recently. Um, the cookbook actually only starts about halfway through, um, and then it ends with some selected menu items, again, all prioritizing the kinds of food that people in their homes would be able to source considering all of the rations that were in effect during the war. Um, but the first half of it is made up of some heavy hitters. Uh, it's a bit of nation building, so you can have a foreword here. It's written by Herbert Hoover. Um, who obviously later became president at the time he was the head of the uh, War Rations Board, and then the food, the world food problem. It reprints an uh, essay by the late Reverend John Wesley, which any uh, religious historians is a name they will recognize. Um, it's really 
talking about the symbolic freight of ideas of work. Um, and that's something that shows up along you know, the objects that I've pulled today, but also a lot of the medieval and Renaissance European objects that are on view in medieval life. So I have shown a variety of work records, that is, you know, sort of documents that were used in the course of work. Uh, this is a little different. This is an illustration of work. Um, it's a page from a manuscript that was made in the court of Akbar, who is the third Mughal emperor. Um, it is the Razam Nama, which is a Persian language translation of the Hindu Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata. Uh, in an appealingly sort of self-referential way, this illustration, which again, it's been cut out of the book, the, uh, the court Razam Nama that this came from no longer survives as an intact book and it's been dispersed through a number of places. Uh, we've got um, a large collection of pages cut from it, but this would have been the first illustration of the book. Um, it's actually a depiction of the translation itself, so it's sort of commenting on itself. Uh, this book was made in 1597, 1598, 1599. Uh, the translation of the Mahabharata into the Razumnama, into the Persian language, would have been about five, ten years earlier. And so they're documenting and celebrating that with this image. Uh, as a ruler, Akbar brought together diverse artists from a range of cultures to work in his court. Um, this illustration specifically shows Hindu scholars and Muslim scholars working together to affect this sort of massive translation. Um, it's an extremely long Sanskrit epic, and so it would have been a, a lot of work to translate. Uh, but it was a Mughal court, and so that means it was a Muslim court. And so you can see in the image, there is still some privileging of the space, sort of symbolically and politically. Um, on the bottom are the Hindu scholars, and then above them, are the Muslim scholars who are the only ones, you know, for example, they're being fanned by attendants. Uh, and so there is a political play at work there, even in the ecumenical, ecumenical space of them both working together to affect this translation. Uh, and so looking back at a more specifically work record, I'm not trying to make the claim that all work is political. Uh, I will leave that to uh, deeper scholars who certainly have and do make that claim. Uh, but more I'm trying to give a sense of the multiplicity of meanings around what a uh, record of work can be. So this manuscript, um, it's unsigned. It doesn't have any text in it. It's just entirely a series of black and red handmade uh, weaving patterns. Um, it's a Pennsylvania German manuscript. Uh, the uh, neat thing about working in special collections, um, so this is an 18th century manuscript. So we don't know who made it. We can date it because someone studied the watermark in the paper and was like, oh, it was made in Delaware in 1771. And so that can give sort of a rough skill at dating. Uh, but one of the cool things about special collections is it's not just a litany of facts about an object. This was made by a Pennsylvania German weaver. Uh, it was made no earlier than 1771. It was made by someone who was sourcing their paper from Delaware. Uh, but it's also we're making space for new stories. So the reason I picked this particular Pennsylvania German manuscript is that it was lent a few years ago to the Fabric Workshop and Museum because the contemporary artist Anne Hamilton was collecting examples of textile culture and textile history for her massive public installation, Habitus, um, which was trying to tell a new story about sort of the social life of textiles. Um, I picked an image from the museum installation the other facet of the installation, for anyone who was able to see it, were these giant mobiles made of just yards of cloth that were installed down in an abandoned uh, ferry port um, on the waterfront. And so it was really neat to be able to tell a new story with this old book and to put some new names around it. Um, because it's true that a lot of rare books can feel very remote to our lives. Um, just in the section, for example, I've been talking about things that were made in the courts of King Louis XII and Emperor Akbar, of course. You know, famous historical figures that we're really not, we're, we're really not maybe feeling a kinship with. Um, but the takeaway that we here try to leave with library users is that uh, they have stories in them that can still tell us about ourselves. And so this here is an Indonesian shadow puppet. Um, it's from an art form that's been around for centuries. 
although uh, this particular example is not that old. I'm going to try to pull it out, give a little view of it. Okay, so we have it now preserved in the theater collection. Um, this puppet's first life was one of active use. Uh, it's made from buffalo hide, uh, painted and jointed. It's not a particularly fancy example, but it does give you a sense um, of how the object could be manipulated. And so you can see at all the joints, there is a piece of cord that ties them together. This again would have been a shadow puppet and you have a stick here that controls the main figure. This stick has been lost, but it controls the additional arm. And then there are also joints at the hips and then also at the legs, although those are a little tight and I'm not gonna manipulate them. It wouldn't be done on a surface like this, it would be done against the screen and what the viewers would be watching would be the shadow rather than you know, sort of what I'm doing now very delicately to try to give you a sense of the object and the artifact and its initial use, even though now you know, when we put it on view, we're not having anyone uh, puppet it like they would have. Um, and so while Yang Kulit is an ancient and traditional form, um, it's certainly not a dead one or one that's not continuing to evolve today. And so that's why I was so excited to see this blog post last week. Uh, it's about the contemporary Malaysian group, uh, Fusion Wayang Kulit. Uh, they are reinterpreting the traditional art of Wayang, which is like UNESCO celebrated, you know, a very important cultural heritage artifact of Indonesia. Uh, but they're interpreting it in a new way. And so you, you might recognize um, a little bit of a Star Wars touch to this, to this puppet. And it's, it was particularly you know, exciting to find this blog post when I was preparing this talk because uh, it's not unintentional that I'm ending here with, with Star Wars. Because Star Wars was actually the first thing I learned about medieval life, the exhibition. Um, the curator of the exhibition, Doc Porter, who came to us from Penn to do this work, uh, she did such an amazing job making this very contemporary story uh, of how Europeans in the Middle Ages uh, engaged with their world. And she's also a big Star Wars fan and pulled in these very medieval looking uh, astronomical Jedi manuscripts. And so I wanted to include that tiny URL at the bottom. If you go to that, it goes to a YouTube video that Doc did with one of her colleagues about the Jedi manuscripts, what they have to say about Star Wars, and what they have to say with our, about our relationship with the medieval world and medieval book culture. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this little tour through time and space. Uh, maybe I will be able to join you soon um, and invite you in to see these spaces physically. We're really hoping to reopen to the public uh, later this fall so you can experience the Medieval Life exhibition and then also take a look at the Companion Gallery um, in person. Uh, and so please do stay tuned about that. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to take some questions.